Welcome to the 924 people who have joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who are watching the podcast. My name is Dr Catherine Boland and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respects to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'm very excited about tonight's self-care webinar. We acknowledge that many people have had difficult experiences in their interactions in the healthcare system and may not have received the kind of best practice care we're talking about in this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to give a broader group of health professionals the skills they need so they can help people more effectively in the future. Personal stories of illness are very important and MHPN often includes consumers and carers on our panels. The chat box, however, is not a forum for personal stories. It's designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing the professionals to share resources and their experiences of practice. So thank you for respecting this. Also, if any of the content in tonight's webinar causes you distress, please seek care if you require it by calling Lifeline on 131114 or dialing 000, Beyond Blue on 1300 22 4636 or contact your GP or local mental health service. Um, I'd like to introduce to you a wonderful group of panellists we have tonight. You can read their biographies in the information that you have been sent but I'm going to introduce them to you one by one. So tonight I'm pleased to have on our panel Professor Simon Wilcox, who is a GP. Simon, GPs have to cope with a wide diversity of clinical presentations, making it difficult to control the nature of your workflow. Does this create special challenges in terms of maintaining it your does, own It does, and I guess, end? as with many careers, it's important to match your own personality to the, the circumstances that you're going to work in. I fondly refer to my sub-syndromal ADHD. It doesn't need medication, it just needs diversity. And in general practice, <laughs> we certainly get that. I also acknowledge that for many of my specialist or consultant colleagues, they actually work in a much narrower field, but often with a much uh, deeper understanding and skill than mine. And I think in a matrix format, we complement each other very well. From a primary care general practice point of view, and it's obviously not just doctors that work at the coalface in primary care as well, um, being aware that at any particular consultation, um, mental health issues may become part of that consultation and that in mm -hmm. fact we should expect that uh, we would be assessing those things as part of a, a, a standard or a routine assessment and interaction at any consultation is important. Mm. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your views on some of the topics tonight. Simon, you're very well researched and knowledgeable in this area, so I'm hoping to take some things away from it myself. I'd like to next introduce you all to Catherine Ferris, the second Catherine on the panel. Hello. Catherine, in your role of working with nurses who will be studying to work in the profession or going into the profession, how important is self-care when yes, you are Catherine, it's to mental definitely health? definitely something that I talk about when new nurses are entering the profession. Obviously, there's going to be so many different challenges that they're going to face entering into mental health that uh, that they need to be prepared for. So um, engaging in some reflection around some strategies that is going to help them throughout the, the next year or so is um, mm. is going to provide the foundation for them to to adjust to quite what can be a, a challenging environment. Mm, I'm sure, particularly in that early part of one's practice. Thanks, Catherine. Thank I look you. forward to hearing you from you later in our discussion. I'd next like to introduce you all to Anne Evans, who is a psychologist from New South Wales and has extensive experience in this area. And how, and particularly with volunteers, I should say. 
And how important is it for volunteers or phone counsellors to have a self-care It really is vital. Um, At Lifeline, we talk a lot to our crisis supporters, and we have about 3,000 of them around the country, about the importance of both elements of self-care for their own well-being and for their ability to support others. They probably get a a bit over us talking about it, to be honest. (laughs) Neil um, Kitchenman from the University of Wollongong did some work on crisis supporter well-being for us. And we've been able to make a really good case for how, just like in other professions, if you're psychologically distressed, if you're not coping, then you can't actually deliver that optimal support to other people. And so that actually motivates people more than their own well-being, in fact, to, to do something about it. So we ask them to have strategies that work for them when they really need to process distressing material. And secondly, we also ask them to ensure that they have strategies in place that work for them in looking after themselves in a bit, bit more of a proactive way as well. So things like ways to soothe themselves after a difficult shift or doing something enjoyable to refresh themselves. We provide support and resources to help both of those sides of self-care because it's an occupational hazard in this sort of work. Yes, absolutely. For all mental health practitioners, I'm sure, too. In fact, Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting, Anne. And I, again, look forward to your expertise throughout our webinar tonight. And finally, but most certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Louise Nash, who is a psychiatrist in New South Wales. Um, Louise is extensive research in the area of self-care, particularly as it pertains to doctors. Louise, can you tell our um, participants tonight, what was the key finding in your research? Um, in conjunction with Simon actually, um, looking at the key areas that that people found stressful in the work that they did with 2,999 respondent doctors. And the things that came up were if you had a current medical legal matter, so that was defined as any kind of complaint process through Mm -hmm. either your hospital or your practice, whether it was a a formal legal matter or a a less formal complaint or coronal inquiry, um, that was a very stressful thing. Uh, Also, not having a holiday in the previous 12 months, working long hours, and your personality style. And we also know from the literature that definitely personality style and the long hours and stressors between home and work are big key factors. So some of those things you don't have a lot of control over, for example, Mm. family history, uh, but you can be mindful of the fact that knowing that certain disorders uh, have a genetic component you need to know that you may be more sensitive to finding um, stressful things might tip you more than some other people. So that's the family history. Of course, you've got your own personal history and you've got your own personality. And in mm-hmm. medicine, we very much like people to be sensitive. We very much like people to be conscientious. And there are two things that are more likely to make you more prone to depression and anxiety, particularly throwing in the huge hours that are often expected of people. So we have certain vulnerabilities within the profession and within the structure of the way the profession runs, that can be uh, make it more likely that someone will actually have some kind of psychiatric morbidity. Mm. This sounds like the perfect storm of factors, personality, workplace structures, the nature of the work. And yes, and home life and imbalance. Some of those other things. Exactly. Very interesting work, always. So you're but also, a great resource. Mm-hmm. <coughs> All right, I'll move on a little and uh, just refresh all of you who haven't participated in one of these webinars about a couple of rules and ways that this evening can work well for us all. First of all, to make sure that everyone has a good experience, the chat box is the general chat amongst other health professionals, as I mentioned earlier. We will discuss resources towards the end of the webinar. If you have technical problems and you need technical FAQs, please use the technical support FAQs tab. And there's a number to call if you're still having difficulty. And I am going to encourage you to provide us with feedback at the end of tonight's webinar by completing the feedback survey, which is located under the survey tab at the top of the screen. So, a couple of important rules. Each, we're going to tonight do things a little bit differently because the topic is so big and we've had so many questions from many of you. 
We're unlikely to be able to answer all of the questions. We'll do our very, very best. But we're going to use the case study that you would have all received as a stimulus to participate in a panellist discussion for the bulk of tonight's presentation. And so by the end of tonight's webinar, what the learning outcomes are, what we hope you will do, is have uh, be able to identify challenges, tips and strategies for self-care to reduce stress and to maintain your well-being. To be able to describe the importance of regular self-care when working in a mental health environment. And importantly, to identify key components of a self-care plan and ways to avoid a crisis, both for yourself and the colleagues that you work with. All right, so I'd like to remind you all about our case study, the story of Carolyn, the clinical psychologist. You'll remember that Carolyn is a clinical psychologist and university lecturer. She has two young children who are aged six and three and she's been in her practice for 10 years, as well as doing two days on the side of university work. So she works three days in her private practice and two days at the university job. The case study tells us that five years ago, there was a new practice manager who was hired who insisted that the clinicians saw eight clients per day. So Carolyn has a very heavy workload, but she perseveres. And the clients are often difficult with personality disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder. The case study also tells us that on the home front, her partner Nick had a serious car accident and is undergoing rehabilitation. And that means he has many appointments, reduced work hours and income. And so there's less help available for Carolyn with children. She has therefore been supplementing the household income with extra work at the university. Her symptoms at the time we find her are that she's exhausted, she's not sleeping well, she's been making mistakes, is feeling stressed and very reluctant to confide in her colleague. Her colleague Maria asks Carolyn if she's okay. And Maria eventually suggests that Carolyn sees her supervisor, but Carolyn responds that she doesn't have time. So Carolyn's intending to go and see her GP to get some sleeping, some medication to help improve her sleep. And that's where we find her. So let's talk a little bit about why in this case, self-care is so important. Um, I'd like to start with you, Simon Wilcox. Can you tell us a little bit about why, what is self-care and why it's important? Particularly sure, for those Catherine, of us working in mental health the, field. the term self-care is one we have to be careful about because I think sometimes people translate it, that as self-treatment or self-management and obviously mm -hmm. it shouldn't be for any medical condition but particularly if somebody's experiencing psychosocial um, health problems. However, I think of self-care as sort of self-acknowledgement and self-awareness, acknowledgement that as our, our patients and clients have a right to good treatment and support, particularly during times of particular stress or illness, um, we as, as clinicians also have that same right. Um, but we, we need a vocabulary to understand what we may be experiencing. It sounds a bit like a no-brainer that uh, as mental health professionals, we don't actually understand the terms that we may be using um, with our patients every, and clients every day. Mm. But the reality is many of us aren't used to stepping into that, that, that patient role. And the first thing to do, I think, when you're um, attending any sort of practitioner, such as myself, a GP, is to say, look, I know I'm a another doctor slash psychologist slash mental health nurse but at this particular point in time I want you to treat me just as you would any other patient. Good mm -hmm. practitioners do that in any case but I think it really helps to, to acknowledge that when, when you do go and talk to somebody for help. In, in um, Caroline's case, I mean any one of the factors in her life at the moment could be considered a significant stressor and disruptor in her life. So it's going to be really important, I think, to recognise that in a simple uh, request for something like hypnotic medication or, or, or sleeping tablets, there's actually so many more issues that we need to plumb and you'd probably spend a lot of time teasing out the various stresses in her life. 
Um, mm. I think, and, and I think it was um, Anne that alluded to it, there's been a, a number of studies both here in Australia and internationally that have shown that if you're actually uh, burnt out or not performing well yourself, you actually are, uh, provide a lower level of care to your clients. Um, it's sometimes hard to engage people who are feeling under stress and, and indeed burnt out in, in finding time to, to take care of themselves. But by, by reminding them that they're actually not providing the care they want to to their clients, Clients, it's often a good way of engaging them. Mm. I'll leave it there. So, I won't talk about strategies at the moment because I assume <laughs> we'll come back to that. We, we sure will. Uh, on that topic of burnout, if I could ask you and Evan, <coughs> what is burnout? What do we mean when we use that term and, and what are burnout? I think there's a lot of confusion around some of the terms that we talk about in, in regard to burnout and vicarious trauma and all kinds of other terms that we bandy around here and some of those terms are often used interchangeably. They can mm -hmm. indeed impact each other but one way to understand it is to see vicarious trauma as a reaction to being exposed to traumatic material that's shared by others resulting in a traumatic stress reaction of some sort and obviously that can be quite normal initially but it can develop into a more serious issue. Burnout in fact appears to be a bit more of a common phenomenon that can be a bit harder to pick up because it's not quite as obvious, the symptoms are not quite as obvious to start with and it often develops over a period of time. It's linked not so much to traumatic material, although it can be, but to excessive and prolonged stress, which seems to be what's happening uh, for Caroline in this case study. And obviously I'm simplifying that a little bit, but some of the symptoms that you might find are things like feeling overwhelmed, being physically and emotionally exhausted, the sense of isolating or wanting to isolate yourself from other people and not making those connections that you normally would have done. Forgetting why you do your job and losing your motivation is to have a significant sense of negativity and mm. questioning your own competence in your job, doubting yourself. So also other things like illnesses and aches and pains can be more common and, and certainly sleeping difficulties as well. So all of those sorts of things seem to be consistent with what Caroline's going through. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And you can, I can really see the link between what you're saying, those signs and symptoms, and what sort of Simon would say earlier about the reason that quality of care is going to be compromised, obviously, if you're dealing with yes, all of those things. Um, all right, so, so talking about the sort of illnesses and uh, propensity to having a physical toll, I might ask you, Catherine Ferris, about what the impact overall of chronic stress yeah, sure. is on uh, the body. If we think about the brain in regards to um, you know, how we manage stress um, and going back to our reptilian brain and thinking about flight, fright or freeze, I think what happens, you know, our, our brains have a pretty, pretty good way of uh, restoring themselves after an adversity. However, in the case of Caroline, I think you know, I've always I already feel overwhelmed reading how many issues that she actually has. That I can see what's happened for Caroline is that um, she's what's happened is she's actually stuck in that position of being permanently in a fight, flight, or freeze response. So what's going to happen is this is just going to create a chronic stress situation where. She is not going to be able to manage the the um, the emotional requirements of the work because she's so consumed with everything that is going on in her, in her life. Mm. Mm. So the what we hear about um, the sleeping problems that she's experiencing that would just be one of many sort of physical, psychological, and other yeah, definitely. Other so. Um, is that what you're saying? Experiencing chronic stress over a longer period of time can lead to uh, both physical, emotional and behavioural symptoms that you mm -hmm. you may or you may not see. So physical symptoms, um, you may experience uh, say more headaches or you may have high blood pressure. Some of the emotional symptoms that you may notice are a lowered mood, um, a lack of focus in your work that you would usually have, in, in attention to detail, um, and, and anxiety. I recently had a, um, a, a graduate nurse call me yesterday actually 
um, who's returned to work from holiday and just out of the blue she said I, I've i just been having a lot of anxiety and panic attacks and, and I'm feeling really tired in, in my mm -hmm. work. and. And so I think we see these types of emotional and physical symptoms and there are also maybe behavioural symptoms that, um, that you may see with their longer term stress including an increase in maybe alcohol use to assist you with maybe uh, issues with sleeplessness. So you're sort of mm -hmm. using one, one uh, measure to counteract the other one right. and all, all not, um, you know, very healthy ways of managing your stress. Yeah, which I imagine has a snowball effect on on, on things. And yeah. it sort of leads me right, quite nicely, um, if I may, into you, Louise Nash, because I know you've done very specific research uh, on doctors and, and incidentally on alcohol use in doctors, as it turns out. What I want to ask you, Louise, is what are the factors that are associated from your research in with poor psychiatric outcomes for mental health practitioners. Well, some of the things I've mentioned already that. that are very clearly in this case. So it's that overload between work and home. Um, mm. It's not at working the long hours, which she's doing. Um, she's got the double whammy of the stress at home with her husband. Um, and for some people, as um, uh, Catherine was just saying, some people actually uh, opt for a negative coping style and alcohol mm -hmm. use is one of those things. And certainly in the study I mentioned before with Simon, um, we did find that people who had a, uh, were, had a current medical legal complaint, they did have a higher alcohol use. Now that was chicken and egg, we, we don't know, it was a cross-sectional mm -hmm. study so we can't tell which way that directional went but it did seem that people were drinking more under stress for some people. Um, so we have to be very mindful about um, resorting to a negative coping style. Whereas there's another study that Simon and I are also involved in again, um, where uh, we looked at different coping styles and we found that many people were using exercise as a positive coping mechanism. So um, there are different ways you could go and that's obviously a positive coping style. And spending time with friends. So if people are able to, I'm not saying in this case study she's struggling to really to to just keep going. Um, so from her point of view we need to, for her, to somehow reduce her stress. And that mm. I would think the logical thing if she could manage it would be to reduce the hours at work. Mm. So reduce, mm. reduce what she is expecting of herself and what other people are expecting of her. So mm. I would actually opt for that being the first thing is to drop down her hours and try and sort of settle down that stress. Mm. Yeah, it's a real, real challenge though. I think the case study does represent many of the stressors that most of us feel when you have, you know, economic pressures or a, a new workplace practice pressure and the nature of the work itself can be difficult. And then as you said in your study, it can be a personality factor or other home factors which are sort of snowballing as, as is evidenced in this case. I might just tap into you, um, back to you, Simon. Um, and I want to talk about the term resilience. Uh, I know that the term is quite a loaded one, but what, what does it mean and what does it mean to be a resilient practitioner? Um, I think the first what comment I'd make resilient? again, Catherine, would be self-awareness, knowing what your, your, your own particular strengths and vulnerabilities are. I think if you use an, an athletic analogy, um, if I wanted to play high level basketball, my height would be a definite sort of uh, factor working against me. So I would have to develop other skills and certainly there have been plenty of shorter basketballers uh, on, on the courts as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, so self-awareness is important. There, there has been some negativity associated with the term resilience in the last year or so, particularly among medical circles. And I understand that because sometimes telling people to become resilient is interpreted as saying that's a cop out so that the system that creates those stresses doesn't have to change. There's no expectation of, of systems change. And any of us who work in complex health systems, particularly uh, working with clients with, with mental health problems, know how complex and difficult those systems can be and how they're often one of the most significant, if not the most significant contribu 
contributed to our stress. So talking about resilience doesn't deny the, um, the importance of, of systems change as well and, and support from within systems. But it does speak to self-awareness, knowing what your own strengths and vulnerabilities are, and we all have them. And that's one of the things I'm sure we all find as health professionals working with clients is helping the patient who sometimes, or the client who, who sometimes feels quite hopeless and helpless to identify mm -hmm. what their own, what I call islands of excellence are, what their own strengths are, and then to build a sort of resilient strategy based around, around those particular things. Equally, they need to uh, recognise what their vulnerabilities are. Um, Louise has talked about the characteristics of, of healthcare practitioners and you know the things that we screen people in for when we're, when we're recruiting them to, to training programs is we like people who are emotionally sensitive and empathic but we also know that that increases our risk of, of burnout and emotional exhaustion. So mm -hmm. we need to have that, that upfront discussion with our colleagues and say, look, the very things that make uh, our clients like us and value their contact with us also make us vulnerable to, to burnout. And burnout such a particular, um, particularly important construct because some of the research I did 20 years ago but others have shown as well is that burnout tends to come before the negative sequelae, the depression, the anxiety, the, uh, the social isolation and some mm -hmm. of the other things that we associate with sort of poor uh, workforce, uh, workplace outcomes. If you, if you have a vocabulary, if you can recognise burnout early and manage it, it's also a, a state characteristic rather than a trait characteristic. I could be really burnt out on Friday afternoon, um, but if I have a good weekend and, and, yeah. and, uh, and somebody supports me, that my burnout levels have con can have considerably dropped by Monday morning. So from that point of view, I think knowing who you are, what your, what your, your past behaviours have been, what your particular vulnerabilities are, sharing your experiences particularly with junior colleagues I think is incredibly useful. Uh, I think mm -hmm. for anybody entering the workforce to hear from senior colleagues about the difficulties and, the, and experiences that they had and the, the, the struggles they had sometimes had to, to develop their own resilience is extremely powerful. Yeah, that's, it's so refreshing to hear you being so candid about that, Simon. And I sometimes wonder whether all of us, and, and maybe I have a prejudice that's more prevalent in medical professionals, we have a culture of coping. We're somehow sort of saying I'm burnt out or I'm not coping with this is seen as a sign of weakness or professional weakness. I know that one of the, someone has been mentioning on the discussion, panel discussion, uh, sorry, the chat line has been saying that their GP told them that you're a psychologist and you should know how to cope. Um, and I guess there are pockets in any profession where we don't get optimal care, but it's very refreshing to hear you talking so candidly about the need to talk to your colleagues about that. I just want to come back to you, Louise Nash, for a minute and just tell us about the personal and professional or other risks if we don't manage well, it's, our self-care. Well, it's not just your self-care because there are times, as Simon's alluded to, where the, um, the structure of the workplace may actually have a negative impact on you. Sometimes the workplace itself can be stressful and distressing and um, that's hard for an individual to change. But um, there are times when that you may actually need to be out of the workplace. Um, so Louise, could I just interrupt you, what do you mean by the structure of the workplace or what are the specifics that would make it something that was uh, going to have an effect on the mental health practitioner? Um, if you have an overload, as I mentioned before, between work and home, let's say uh, some people might be expected to do 80 hours a week work. It's not mm -hmm. usual, but it can happen. And uh -huh. that on top of family um, expectations is a very difficult thing if you're on call and overnight shifts are, mm. uh, have that expectation. So, yeah. And if there's work um, shortages, as happens in some of our medical professions, then you feel yeah. you can't let your colleagues down, so you mm. are on a doing more than your fair share. Um, yeah. Then there's also the burden of the exam processes that our juniors have to go through. So mm -hmm. these are work structures that the individual is, is within. So yeah. then there are things so that's why I'm saying it's hard and, and also we do as the press is aware from some uh, kind of shocking stories that happened two or three years ago, we, we have um, in the medical workforce and also I think in the nursing workforce but I'm not aware of their direct studies on that, we do have um, a high rate of bullying and harassment and that often happens in very hierarchical uh, workplaces. 
So this is another, when I talk about work structures, this is another one. And so there needs to be, and fortunately, certainly in New South Wales, we're trying to improve the system whereby if you have a difficulty at work, particularly if you're a junior, and the logical reporting line is that you discuss it with your supervisor, but if you can't talk to your supervisor about it because mm. either it may involve your supervisor or you think your supervisor may not be um, supportive of you, and don't forget the supervisor signs off on the progression. Wow. In New South Wales now, it's been set up that there will be, or there are, there's a phone line that will um, enable you to be connected to advice from a senior doctor who is nothing to do with your workplace from a different whole hospital system. So there's a way you can get help. There's also, of course, the kind of um, doctor's helplines that are available. So we're trying to provide structural change for that. Yeah. But And we've got better with safe working hours, but we've still got stories of people having car accidents on the way home when they're falling yeah. asleep. So they're the kind of structural things that need to be addressed. Right, yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, I think it's true, and you, you've highlighted some in a particular workplace, but I know from some of the earlier questions and comments we were getting on the chat line about some of the particular um, workplace toxicities or toxic people, workplace politics, unrealistic demands. We might talk about that a bit later. I'd like to come back now to our case study, if you remember Paul Carolyn. And I'll come back to you, Simon, because Carolyn has come to you asking for medication to manage her sleep. How in the first um, appointment with her, assuming that you've been her GP for a while, how would you manage this request or how would you first go about... Thanks, Catherine. That's a really her? important question to ask. If I was lecturing to um, trainee GPs, as I often do, and I gave them this scenario, I suspect what they'd say to me is, is, oh look, we know that hypnotic sleeping medication is bad, you know, you can become dependent on it, and we'd actually counsel the patient against using it. This is not going to be helpful to Carolyn in this particular mm. circumstance. She's already feeling guilty from all of the stresses that she's under and her own sense of underperformance. So I think it's really important to use that sort of trigger, the, the, the ticket of entry in a sense that she's used into the consultation to gently help her talk about all of the other things that are happening in her life. So in this particular scenario, I think the useful thing to do would be to say, tell me about your sleeping. And from that would be, tell me about what's happening, what else is happening in your life. As you've said, if I'm a regular GP, I presumably know about the stresses, particularly the significant stress of her husband's injury and, and ongoing mm -hmm. disability. But I may not be aware of some of the workplace stresses and hopefully she'll feel safe enough to, to start talking about some of those things. Um, I, I must admit, if I had, if if I managed to elicit all of the things in the scenario, I would be thinking this was really a crisis situation at this particular mm -hmm. point in time. There are so many things that are that are potentially going wrong in Caroline's life that I I would probably be counselling her very early on um, that we need a time out. Um, we need to create a, 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 some time for her to uh, to uh, rest, to reevaluate, to recharge her own sort of emotional and physical batteries. The sleep side of things would probably be um, not the main focus, but certainly I wouldn't um, dissuade her from addressing that and may even use medication in the short term. She knows she's mm -hmm. a mental health professional. She knows the potential mm -hmm. risks associated with it. But I think the really important thing is not to devalue the, the, the very thing that she's felt that she can come and talk to, to me about. Gosh, Simon, I do hope that Carolyn has a GP like you, uh, so empathic and considered in that response. I'm now going to talk to all of our panellists, and we'll start with you, Anne Evans. I want you to ask uh, to tell me or tell us all a little bit about some specific useful self-care strategies sure, we'd that like we can to talk to our crisis supporters in particular about particular strategies before, during and after a challenging interaction. And I often use these sorts of things myself, but I'll take you through the kind of approach that we would use with our crisis supporters. Right. And basically what we would do is ask them before they're taking a call or a chat or a text, making sure that they ask themselves if they're in a good emotional place to do that as the, as the very first thing and make sure that that is the case before in fact they, they go on the phones or they, they interact with someone in another, in another context. Then. The next thing really would be to give themselves a bit of time to get settled and pre be present 
for that particular interaction and that might mean taking a short break between calls or just giving yourself mm -hmm. a few seconds to just be present. And I think sometimes when we see people back to back, that is a bit of a trap that we fall into. We're mm -hmm. still kind of emotionally in the last interaction and we're in going into the next one. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to do that. And then just give yourself a relaxation or mindfulness technique, a really sh short one, a, a grounding exercise, the sort of thing you might give to clients, just to make sure that you are feeling calm and present for that particular interaction. I really think that can make a difference. Mm. Then during an interaction that's challenging, you can't do an awful lot, but you can notice what's happening for you. You can notice the reaction both in your body and also your emotional reaction. And sometimes it takes a bit of practice to do that, but, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And then we ask them just to practice a simple technique they can, they can use to stay calm and remain present focus on what's going on now and focus on the health seeker because that's obviously the most important thing in the moment. But then afterwards, mm -hmm. we mustn't forget to do something about what we've heard. And the most important thing is really to reflect on what happened and on your own reaction, including that reaction in the body, which a lot of people, a lot of our crisis supporters, it's been a, a bit of a change for them to think about actually this, this stress is actually happening within my body and then also mm. the emotional reaction that they're having to that. And again, mm. some people are better at naming that than other people and it's something that we like to teach people to be able to name it because there, there does appear to be some evidence if you can understand it and name it and recognise it, it has less of, a, of an effect on you. We are so do you mean and do you mean naming yeah. sorry, do you mean naming the emotion or naming the state you're in? What could you tell mm. me what you mean? I guess naming your feelings. I mean, there are there are mm -hmm. some individuals who find it difficult to to express and talk about feelings, and yeah. sometimes even to name what that feeling might be. So that churning in the pit of the stomach, mm -hmm. naming it as anxiety, for example. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just important to actually have words for it and to be able to explain it. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I guess is really important from from our point of view is to sit with the uncomfortable feelings, and that's a bit of a difference from some of the self care literatures that you'll see out there that is all about feeling better and distracting yourself in a way, but it's really, really important to process what's going on. And so we try and get people to, to reflect on their reaction and sit with it and not try and push it away because obviously we've seen a lot of work in the, in the literature too around the fact that if you don't process, it will kind of come back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's a really important part of what we do and we give people tools to reflect and to process what's been going on. The other thing I guess is if it's really strong, making sure that they do seek an, uh, some sort of assistance from a supervisor or from somebody else and we can talk a little bit about what that might look like later on. Yeah. But then yeah. finally I guess afterwards, taking some time to recharge and so recognising that you know, it's been a tough day or, it's, or it was a tough call, making sure that there's something you do to refresh and recharge yourself and I'm sure we'll talk mm -hmm. about, it, about that later as well. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're really helpful in situ kind of strategies that um, are, are good for us all to remind ourselves of, Anne. I might turn to you now, um, Catherine Ferris, and ask you about some what you think some of the most useful self-care yeah, strategies you, are. Thank you, I was reflecting clinicians. on everything that was being saying and I think that um, I was uh, thinking about a young male a graduate nurse that I was working with recently who experienced a really significant traumatic adverse event in the workplace. However, he was very reluctant to seek assistance. You know, so we have this terrible issue about um, mental health professionals having our own uh, psychological trauma and, and um, being able to seek help with that. Mm. Um, so I, I was very acutely aware that he actually is a, um, he does, uh, uh, he's a sportsman and so he does a lot of sports. Mm -hmm. So I tried to talk to him about if he was playing sport and he physically injured himself, uh, would he require um, a, to see a, a, a medical specialist? to be able to get back into his sport and his, you know, and he was able to see what I, how I was trying to frame that, um, you know, that, that his psych, he's been 
so traumatised by his experience that he, he did require to see a, a mental health professional outside of work. So I think it's just trying to normalise that um, us as mental health professionals that we, we too experience um, and mental health issues and so um, I just try and be um, really compassionate when I'm listening to the people and, and yeah, try and normalise those experiences for them. Mm. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. And I might now um, come back to you, Louise Nash. What are the specific or the useful self-care strategies that you well, would Well, as I've already mentioned, um, and it ties in with this case, um, if you're working long hours and not getting enough sleep, we know that that's a problem. The sleep mm -hmm. issue that this case has is a very common one. Um, and we know that if you have a disruption in your sleep, that can lead to a mood disorder. If you have a disruption, if you have a mood disorder, that can lead to a sleep disorder. So they're very cyclically, cyclically mm -hmm. linked. And anxiety and mood also kind of wrap around each other a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we we want her to have some self care techniques, and we know sleep's really important. Um, we so also Louise, what would be just to interrupt you there? What would be the sort of practical um, manifestation of that? What would be the techniques that you would help Carolyn with, or someone if, if a clinician is having trouble with their sleep? Is it sleep hygiene? Is it yeah, well, you start with sleep hygiene, but the, the the more important thing would be to try and do as as Simon was saying. I think we need her to r reduce or stop for a while. Um, you talk, of course, go through the sleep hygiene. Similarly to Simon, it may be that um, she may benefit from short term of some kind of sleeping agent, but you've got the other things to work with as well. And the fact that she mm -hmm. can talk to you and may help her as well. She may have mm -hmm. a supervisor. I think that's mentioned. She says she hasn't mm -hmm. got enough time to go. But yeah. supervision under these circumstances is hugely important mm -hmm. because she's she needs, um, well, she needs supervision to help her manage her caseload. And I think there's some mention there that there's some concern she might have missed something or done mm -hmm. something not as well as she normally would. She needs supervision for her, her clinical work but she actually needs a treatment, she needs management of the stress she's under herself and the two things are very different. You don't go to a supervisor for your own personal self-care. That mm. is to reflect on things and to look at your clinical um, decisions. I think in psychiatry, I think we're very lucky. We, we have something called peer review groups and I think that was mm -hmm. mentioned at the start. And when, particularly when we work in emotionally challenging areas as we all do in mental health, um, in the mental health professions, having um, a peer review group or, or colleagues that you can bounce ideas off is actually a great way to help you manage the stress of, of the workplace and of the client, kind of client difficulties we can have. So I think mm. it's a really good thing. It may not be what she needs in the acute now, mm -hmm. um, but I think um, they, they asked other things that are helpful from a self-care point of view. Um, it's sleep, eating well, exercising, they're all good yoga, relaxation techniques, mindfulness. There's all evidence mm -hmm. to show these are helpful in moderate to mild um, depression and certainly helpful in anxiety. So they'd be very mm -hmm. useful for her to use some of those proven techniques. Um, mm -hmm. But if she's moved more into a more severe um, state, then you know she, she needs more than that. But certainly she should start with some of those self-help te techniques. Mm, mm, that's really helpful. And Simon, back to you. Have you got any surefire self-care strategies that either you use yourself or that you would recommend? Um, I to use a fairly sort of simplistic model, and I work a lot with men, both young men and older men as well. And I often use mm -hmm. the car analogy, and sort of you know, do you, the, the question to ask is, do you have a car and do you get it serviced? And of course, everybody says, of course, I get it serviced, because the mm -hmm. implication is otherwise you wait for something to fall off before you sort of trundle it in. And then yeah. if once people accept that there's an you know 
know, it, it's sensible to look after themselves or what sort of things, in the same way that when you take your car to the service station, you may not know exactly what they do, but you know they're going to check the lights and look under the hood and check the tyres and, and, and do a few things like that. So I usually say to people, well, you know, what about your physical health? And Louise has mentioned mm -hmm. a number of those things, and that's often the least threatening thing to talk about because it's sort of eating well and exercising well and, and mm -hmm. sleeping well. And then their emotional health, how do they cope with feeling frustrated at times and do they get angry at times and what triggers that and, and, and what sort of techniques do they use to manage it. Social or community health is a really important one I, I find mm -hmm. and that's where people are often very isolated. They may work in a busy organisation or live in a very big city but they may, mm. may actually not be part of any community and, and Louise referred to a sort of a peer group but a peer group in a sense is that, is that sort of community that you develop around yourself with some shared experiences and understanding of what the other people are going through and, and making sure that people do identify. I often say to them, who's the person that you would go to if everything went pear-shaped? preferably who are the two or three people and if they can't immediately tell me then they need to go out and find them because while life's going well we're all fine but we can't we don't know when when things are going to go pear-shaped and the other two domains I talk to them about are, are the sort of intellectual cognitive health what are the things they do to stimulate themselves and finally their spiritual health you know what 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 gives their life meaning and purpose and again it comes back to vocabulary that a number of us have spoken about if people recognize that there's this sort of anchoring to Term, that they can build something around and again none of us is perfect in all of those domains mm -hmm. and I think help share, sharing your own inadequacy at times uh, and saying look I really struggle with X, Y and Z helps mm -hmm. people to realise that no, none of us are perfect but if we, if we one by one build up some of these resources then we're less likely to be um, uh, impaired by the, by the experiences that we have. Mm, that's a very holistic and lovely way to look at it. I certainly feel less than perfect in all of those domains, but it's good to hear I'm not the only one. Um, all right, I want to just come back again to Carolyn and talk about the fact that she's in a very difficult work environment and it illustrates a common concern for many of us where there's a dilemma of a very heavy client load. And in the case study, Carolyn's practice manager has insisted that she sees eight clients per day. I want to turn to you now, Catherine Ferris, and ask uh, how you think practitioners should manage their self-care if they're in a difficult working environment, for example, like Carolyn is, or other sorts of difficult working environments. So some of our um, chat uh, participants have talked about workplace bullying, harassment, mm. or toxic people or very unrealistic demands or sort of onerous administrative tasks. <laughs> There's a real dilemma that private practitioners have between balancing seeing clients and the administrative and other aspects of their practice. So how do we manage self-care with those kinds of institutional yeah, so or organisational It all stressors? sounds very overwhelming, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. So I think it, it does, yes. Yeah, so, and I really liked what Simon was saying about all, putting all of those strategies in place around self-care and maintaining the things that you had done previously. Um, so I think what's really important is to always know that there must be someone there that can help you throughout these mm -hmm. times and it's okay to ask for help. Um, I think we, you know, try and soldier on um, but mm -hmm. obviously in the case of Caroline that, um, you know, it, it's not working. So it's really, it's going to be really important for her to um, get help at this time and also to really set some strict boundaries around what she can and can't do at this stage. Mm -hmm. And that might be, um, with, it sounds like this, the person that's checking in with her, Maria, mm -hmm. is quite concerned with her. So um, maybe it's, um, if Maria and her have a close relationship, they could sit down together and work out some strategies about how they could approach the practice manager about the, mm -hmm. you know, how this is really impacting on her and maybe even the other members of the, the team there that um, it's just unrealistic and, um, you know, you're not going to keep staff when they're just so burnt out like this. 
Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a common concern. It's certainly something that um, some people had a lot of concerns about from different professions about. So I think what I'm hearing in everyone's um, view about this, about Carolyn, is that something's got to give and it seems that she needs to cut back on her working and, and certainly seeing eight clients a day, especially given all the other things going on in her life, is an unrealistic demand. Yeah, um, and even just with the um, the family situation, is there people in her in her home environment? Is mm -hmm. there respite opportunities? Who in her family networks can she um, ask for help from as well? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you know she's really not asking for help a lot in mm -hmm. in this situation. So I'd be really wondering what that's about as well. Mm, that's a very good point, actually. Um, actually, you've, you've raised for us, Catherine, one of the issues I wanted to touch on next, which is our relationships with our colleagues. It's often in our workplaces where we see our colleagues struggle or where colleagues would notice the, first be, the first people to notice the deterioration in our wellbeing. So I guess I want to ask a number of the panellists, and I'll start with you, Simon, about how we can best assist our colleagues there's, there's if we're concerned a, about quite them. a literature that shows that the closer that you work to somebody, the more likely you are to pick up early signs of distress rather than true impairment. We did a neat little study with, with junior doctors about 20 years ago which showed that the medical administrators and the nurse unit managers could tell if the doctor was dangerous or impaired. They had no idea that if the do doctor was just distressed and, and, mm. uh, and worried by things, but the, the, the nurses on the ward and their peer junior doctors knew that they weren't themselves. So that's the mm. first thing to say that if you're working in a workplace and you're a sensitive person you will pick up those early subtle clues and often they're just signs of distress not anything major but that's when it's best to intervene. I think the second point to make is that if you are going to intervene and, and you need to think about what your rights and responsibilities are, we're not mm. our, our, our brother or sister's keeper, we're not responsible for mm. their outcomes so we have to define in our own head what the level of our, our, our approach might be. But um, making it clear when you talk to somebody what hat, what I call what hat you're wearing. If you're in a supervisory role it can be quite threatening or intimidating to say mm. to somebody you don't seem to be yourself. So so in that situation saying, look, let's have a cup of coffee. I'm just talking to you as a peer or a friend now. I'm a bit worried about you or I, I, you, you don't seem to be yourself can make it much easier for somebody to, to talk about what's what's affecting them or what's troubling them at the time. Uh, if, if there's some confusion about whether you're somebody who's also going to be assessing them or, or performance potentially performance managing them down the track. And, and then the final comment I would make is the one that I think Louise referred to about having a, a community of, of, of your other professionals around you. They know what you're going through and making sure that you normalise that process of periodically sitting down and talking about, you know, we, we, we talk about balance groups and things like that, to periodically talking about the inevitable stresses that we experience, particularly working in mental health, and normalising a discussion around it without having to necessarily personalise it. I think often practitioners, Simon, get really worried about the sort of professional obligations to report on their colleagues. Can you tell us a little bit about the professional responsibilities if you are really worried about someone's standard of care? Yeah, very happy to, to speak to that because it is something that makes all of us very anxious and I, mm -hmm. I, I chair the board of a big indemnity company which deals with a lot of sort of concerns and complaints about about health professionals, particularly doctors. I think the reassuring thing here is that we don't actually have an obligation to uh, intervene or to report our colleagues unless we directly observe behaviours that I think any of us would, would consider uh, needed an intervention. So if you if you observe somebody directly who's, who's who's working under the influence of alcohol or other drugs or who has breached some sort of boundary, particularly a personal or sexual boundary, um, then there's an obligation to report that person. But that's actually a very, very high bar and I don't think most of us would have problems of, of actually complying with that. Just being concerned about somebody does, it does not meet any sort of threshold in terms of, of, of an obligation to report. Um, I think 
from a moral point of view, if you are concerned or you are hearing things, um, talking to somebody, it might be the person that you're concerned about or somebody else, to see what can we do and how can we engage them. I think that's the really important thing to do and the earlier we do it, uh, the better the outcome is likely to be for, for the individual. But from that point of view, none of us should be worried. In fact, I think there's a lot of evidence that by being worried that you might have an adverse effect on somebody by, by saying something actually tends to lead to worse outcomes because it delays the implementation of any support process. Mm. That's, that's really reassuring actually Simon, and very um, educative for all of us. Um, and Evans, I want to ask you now how you think we should best approach our colleagues. What should, how should we approach them if we're worried about them? I usually find that the best way to approach it is, is to be quite straightforward and to talk about behaviour you've, you've observed because not too many people can argue with that. If you've seen mm -hmm. a change in their behaviour, if you've seen them not coming out for coffee, if you've seen them uh, doing things differently, working longer hours, whatever you've noticed, that's usually what I would start with and people can't actually get too um, confronted by that conversation or not mm -hmm. as confronted as if you perhaps went up to them and said you're looking really depressed. <laughs> Just talk about no, um, what you've observed. So what, whatever you've actually observed in that environment and let them know that you're concerned about them and that you want to help. I think as Simon was saying it's far more important to show concern and to actually intervene than it is to have all the right words or say all the right things. Mm. If people if people aren't um, asking them and reaching out to them, they may feel even more isolated. So it's just really important to say what you've noticed, ask what's going on, and show that you really are concerned for them as a person, not mm. for, not because of any anything else that's going on, but for them as a person, and just let them talk when they're ready. And obviously, if you're not the person that they want to talk to, being encouraging them to reach out to somebody else and to talk to somebody else about it. Mm. That's really good advice. Louise Nash, how do you approach or do you think we should best approach colleagues if we're concerned or wish to assist them? Um, very much the same as has just been said. I think um, mm -hmm. where you've got something you can say directly then that's appropriate. Um, but showing you care is the most important thing and um, that you are concerned for them. And I think that there, there's like the um, I think the best thing is to encourage someone to seek help. Now, whether that be medical help, psychological help, legal help, that mm -hmm. you need, that that's a good step. So, for example, in this case, the fact that she's gone mm -hmm. to her GP is going to open up. It's mm -hmm. appropriate help seeking. The, the other thing I want to mention, it's a little bit off track from what you've asked, but it's been raised, there is sometimes a fear within the health profession of help seeking. And there was a big Beyond Blue study that most people will have heard of. It's about, I think, 12,000. Again, it's a medical study. Um, about 12,000 people responded, um, doctors and medical students. And 53% um, said that they feared seeking help because of confidentiality, 37% um, because of embarrassment, and 34% because of concerns over registration. And I completely agree with what Simon said, which is that issue about the mandatory reporting laws, the bar is high. But what we want to do, as, as has also been said, we, we want people to, to seek help early and so that things don't become more severe and then more difficult. I'd much rather be treated by someone who has a depressive illness who is receiving treatment. That's mm -hmm. not an issue to me at all. So we, we want people to seek help, have appropriate treatment. And fortunately, we have excellent treatment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess one of the things that some of the comments on the chat have been in, with respect to, to our case study, Carolyn is saying, well, you know, the strategies we're talking about are all very well and good, but the, Carolyn has very real sort of conflicting demands. She, what if she can't reduce her work hours because she needs the money, her husband is not working, she's got two young children. I, I guess I'm going to open this up to anyone who wants to answer on the panel. How do we deal with those very real kind of conflicting demands or someone like Carolyn who when Maria approaches her says, I'm too busy, I don't have to. But we can recognise and see a real need. What, what would any of the panellists like to comment on that? In an, it's Louise, mm -hmm. Louise speaking. In an ideal 
workplace. I appreciate she's got the clinical load, um, but she's also got her university load. And there are maybe someone could help relieve her a little bit of work. Maybe she can take sick leave. So mm -hmm. there are, depending on her contract, if she's there two days a week, she will be entitled to sick leave. And uh, yes, that will overload her work colleagues, but at the moment she may not be quite as effective as if she actually had some time away, got better and then came back. So I think that there are ways, and someone else mentioned, has she got help, other help that can be drawn on to help her at home? So um, she just simply needs to reduce the load expected of her at the moment and sick leave is, uh, is one way to do that. I just yeah. think she needs to be working less or not working for a while. Yeah, and she I may actually. That. Part of the problem is that, as I mentioned in the literature, that work home overload. Her home life at the moment: two small children, unwell husband. It's huge. Mm. So um, some help needs to come from somewhere. The finances, sure, they're problematic, but she she needs relief at the moment. Yeah. I think that's so well put, Louise. Thanks for addressing that concern. All right, I want to now turn to um, something that we're all confronted with and some of the panellists tonight have referred to specific situations where we are confronted with very traumatic situations um, because of the nature of our work. Um, Simon, I'll start with you. How should mental health practitioners plan for or prepare for traumatic or adverse events? Or should we? Um, and, and Catherine, I'm, I'm assuming that we're referring to sort of the, the, the adverse events happening to themselves or in terms of their own coping skills because I think probably day to day we deal with clients who are at varying levels of stress and distress. Mm -hmm. um, I think again it's helpful to have the discussion with your colleagues. You don't say if you had this happen, you say when this ha happens because mm -hmm. unless you're um, a, a real outlier on the bell curve, we're all going to have situations where for a whole range of maybe work related reasons, maybe personal reasons, <clears throat> there's going to be the crisis day where everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, Crisis plans are useful. I've already referred to my sub-syndromal ADHD and I don't work terribly well with sort of detailed plans that have 37 components and every uh -huh. box has to be filled in. But I think some general principles and some of them I've already alluded to, who are the three people you would call um, when there was a crisis in your own personal life? How would they help you? What sort of things would you, would you unload? Um, as a as a health care provider, and I think anybody on the webinar can be involved in this, um, what would my role be? What would you like me to do in this particular situation? And that's where you can start uh, introducing the idea of time away from work or time away from your stresses, as Louise has, has suggested, and start introducing the idea that there are safety jackets, if you like, stowed under the seats. If something happened then, you do have sick leave and we could access that. Um, who would help with your children if both you and your husband were significantly unwell at the same time? It's a not mm -hmm. uncommon uh, phenomenon in, in crisis situations where what I say both partners have their flat batteries and no, no, neither of them is actually in a position to recharge the other. And in that situation, okay, who's the external person? Is it a family member? Um, that, that you could turn to uh, who, who could support in that situation and everybody's circumstances are different. Um, but from that point of view I think getting people to normalise the idea that you can't work in health, I often say you can't work in health and eliminate stress, you know if you're working in health you're dealing with people who are, who are dealing with difficult situations doubly so you can't work in mental health and not deal with stress. Uh, and we have to be the role models that show to our clients that we, de we, we, we experience it too, but we also have strategies for dealing with it and that we're not Robinson Crusoe, we don't ever try to deal with it solely on our own. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the, the crisis plan from your perspective is a real contingency plan. These are, the, these yep. are my go-to people, this is what I would look out for and this is how I would kind of potentially manage those situations. And, and depending on the 
Absolutely, and depending on the yeah. circumstances, where you go from there might be quite different. Um, sitting yeah. down and seriously reviewing your work situation. I mean, if, 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 if I was understanding Caroline's work situation, I, when she was feeling more comfortable and a little bit more, more robust herself, talking to her, is this actually the right work situation for you? If you've been in a situation for a number of years where you feel you've got an unsympathetic, unsympathetic practice manager, maybe yeah. it's time to, rather than wait for the practice manager, to change, uh, maybe yeah. we need to consider what your options are. Uh, you don't do that at the first consultation or the sure. first encounter because she's already feeling very fragile and vulnerable. But if you've got that initial crisis, as you say, contingency plan, then you build the other components um, longitudinally. Um, mental health, as with any illness, is, uh, is a journey where, as a practitioner, the care provider, um, I think the visual analogy, and I'm a very visual person, is of walking mm -hmm. beside the person, helping them through the journey. One of the nice things about working in health is that our clients actually often help ourselves, and I'm not talking about uh, help us ourselves, I'm not talking about sort of uh, boundary issues and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, the value that we get from knowing yeah. that we're, we're helping our clients. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, that taps into some of the domains you were talking about earlier about the sort of yep. rationale for, yeah. I can the spirituality see. of why we do what we do. Yeah, I, I think it is important in this discussion. I mean, I know it's not sort of answering the, the crisis mode that Carolyn finds herself into, but perhaps later down the track, that's a really important self-reflection exercise. Um, all right, I, I'll, I'll turn to you, Catherine Ferris, and ask you what do you think about a crisis plan and what it should include or involve? Yes, I was quite fascinated when I saw this question. I mean, I don't personally have a crisis plan that I have. However, I think, um, as I, I maybe someone mentioned earlier, about self-awareness. So um, understanding yourself and having a really good awareness of some of the things that um, that may you may face um, and you may experience when you're under a lot of stress and so just putting your hand up and saying I, I need some time out here you know there's there's just too much going on and um, so really owning that and mm -hmm. um, I mean I, I don't write it down I think intuitively I know myself when I'm experiencing a lot of stress within my work and then I know that for me personally um, if it's something it may be a conflict with a with a manager or I will then totally actually stand up remove myself from my desk and I'll mm -hmm. take myself for a 10 minute walk and just breathe um, and I think that just gives me the time and the clarity to breathe and relax and and then come back to the situation. I think because sometimes for me I can get caught quite caught up in my own headspace and I get um, triggered and then I get hooked into into this scenario in my head and I'm I'm saying to myself, oh, you know, I'm bad, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, you mm -hmm. know, they're gonna fire me, I hate everyone. Um, mm -hmm. and I I go through all these these thoughts. However, taking myself away and having some space I'm able to reflect and realise uh, it, it's probably not that bad um, mm -hmm. as, as, I'm, as I'm making out. So yeah, so there, that's what I do um, and I also always just challenge my negative thoughts as well. Am I, is this situation real here or am I creating a bit of a conspiracy theory in my mm -hmm. own head based on just little points in the conversation that, and then I make up this big story so yeah I'm just always checking in with myself and trying to self-regulate my emotions. Mm, mm. That's really helpful Catherine and what about you do you have a crisis plan or do you think a, what do you think a crisis plan for a mental health professional should involve? I haven't like the others, I haven't really written it down, but I guess I, mm -hmm. I try and follow the same sorts of practices that, that we've talked about and the, the ones that we talk about with our crisis supporters as well. I have people that I can talk to both in the professional environment and personally and different people for different things, if you like. Um, so it's really important when I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed to make sure that I connect with other people and they're 
it's really important to choose who those people are as well because there are friends you can have a cup of coffee with and you feel completely drained afterwards and there are yeah, friends yeah. where you can do have the same sort of interaction length of time interaction and you feel really energized and 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 um, quite different about the world so it's about choosing those people really well mm -hmm. and I also know the importance of, of processing my reactions to my work so when I'm feeling overwhelmed what I'll do is I will take some space and time and I really um, I really uh, thought the idea of going for a walk is a really good one because that's, that's one of the things that I do. I mm -hmm. Importantly, I used to go for walks for exercise and I'd make all the phone calls that I hadn't made during the day. Now I don't do that. I turn the phone off or onto silent and mm -hmm. I just let myself be. And that really works for me. I'm processing, I'm letting my mind go where it needs to go and I'm just disconnected from everything else that is happening in my world. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really helpful. And then if it has been a difficult day, whether I feel like it or not, um, at the end of it, I'll try and do something fun, even if it's really simple, like watching a silly cat video or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with silly cat videos, Anne. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think they're quite as useful as a holiday and some of the other. No, maybe things, not. But maybe not. But maybe that maybe they are on a on a personal level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Louise, Nash, what about you? Do you have any tips for us or for our participants in terms of a crisis plan, the importance of one or what it should involve? Um, a bit like um, as Anne just said, I have some trusted colleagues that I can call on at any time, day or night, for 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 help. And um, mm. uh, I've been very lucky that I have those. Um, uh, and similarly, in my private life, I have people I can call on and and call for help and I would do that. So I, I feel very fortunate in that I have those relationships. Um, I also learned early on um, that a bit like our case study, I had small children while I was working in psychiatry and it was emotionally too much. So I learned early on that I could not do um, a full load of clinical work. So, so I, I've worked more in a preventative way rather than an acute crisis way. So mm -hmm. I found that I could not give, um, if I was going to, I could not give to my children what I felt I needed to give them if I had given mm -hmm. it all at work. So I therefore mm -hmm. learned very quickly that I could not do this kind of work more than a couple of days a week. But I've been fortunate mm -hmm. to have a, um, and, and I imagine the same in all of the health professions, uh, I'm fortunate that I've got a balance of my um, academic role and my clinical role. And that's a lovely thing for those people who have some kind of teaching or supervision role. That's mm. a lovely thing. Um, yeah. So having a, having a career where you have some diversity within your professional role, I think enriches you and also preserves you. Yeah. So I that's, think that that's my tip. Yeah, that's great. Um, Catherine uh, Ferris, I think you wanted to uh, make a comment about this. Yeah, so I, I was just thinking. Um, I I teach the graduate nurses this also, so I say to them, and which has been helpful for me. If I'm if I've had something significant happen, and I'm coming home from work, driving home, I'll pick a landmark on my way home, mm -hmm. and I'll. And I'll say, that's it, I'm leaving that behind me now. Mm -hmm. However, if I go past that landmark and I'm still thinking about this issue, I know that that's when I really need to then go back and seek clinical supervision or reflect mm. with someone as well. So mm. I think that's important to really differentiate what's work is you need to leave that at work and to separate the two really strongly and find find something that really separates the two. Yeah, I like that physical barrier, it's fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. I have learnt so much tonight from this brilliant group of experts. The, the CAT videos, the landmarks on the way home, the crisis plan and the importance of a holiday are things that I'm going to take away. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also thank you all for logging on tonight and giving us your good time. I'd like to please remind you to complete the exit survey and give us feedback so we can continue to produce high quality webinars for you that are relevant. Um, and I invite you to participate in future MHPN webinars. So keep an eye out for notifications. 
The next MHP and webinar will be on engaging with parents and infants in the first thousand days, uh, which will occur on the 17th of September. And soon after, on the 26th of September, another webinar on BPD, self-injury and suicidality. Uh, so you can register for those webinars. We know that practitioner self-care is a very important aspect of working in mental health. MHPN supports balance and peer support groups where practitioners from a range of disciplines meet and confidentially present cases in a respectful, supportive and non-judgmental environment. And we've heard how important that is tonight. So please download the network flyer from the resources tab below if you'd like to um, learn more about that. And again, if I could encourage you to complete the survey at the top of your screen, you will be emailed a certificate of attendance for this webinar within four weeks. And you'll be emailed a link to the online resources associated with this webinar within two weeks. Before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And thank you to everyone, including our panellists and all of you for your participation this evening. Good night.